Uh, I want to introduce to you just now uh, Paul Jacobs, who is the recipient of the 2013 Edison Achievement Award. Um, Paul received his uh, undergraduate, graduate, and ultimately PhD degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, finishing finally in 1989, and then went off uh, to Toulouse for one year as a postdoc, and then joined Qualcomm Incorporated, uh, initially as a team leader in software development. And I think it's very interesting, at least to me, that his first task was to do software development for smartphones. Now, to me, 1990 doesn't seem like that long ago, but um, compared to my Android phone, uh, it's ancient prehistory, uh, and obviously Paul was working on smartphones far uh, sooner than they actually existed. Um, of course, Paul now has risen through the ranks and done many things at Qualcomm, and at present is the chairman of the board and the CEO. He holds about 50 US patents. Uh, he, in addition to receiving this year's award, he also has uh, an Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, Circuits and Systems Society um, Industrial Leadership Award. Uh, he has the NCAFP Global Business Leadership Award, uh, the Samsung Award of Merit in 2012, and he has several other major recognitions. And we're, we're so grateful, Paul, that you could attend, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mobile technology and how it's impacting uh, not just our lives, but how it's going to impact almost everything that we interact with in the world around us. There we go. So I, I, uh, I recently did a, a speech to, to open the Consumer Electronics Show, and we came up with this theme of Born Mobile. And, and it was a little confusing, because we weren't really trying to say that it was all about people who were born in the generation that had mobile phones, but something a little bit more deep, that it's amazing how all of us who use mobile technology just adapted to it, whether we were born far before it came out or, or kids that you know, have grown up with it. And somehow it became a very natural thing for human beings just to accept as part of their life that they would touch the screen of a phone and interact with it and have access to basically all of the you know, gathered knowledge of, of humanity almost right, right in the palm of your hand and, and how quickly that just became something that we all accepted as, as the way the world is. But really, if you think back, it wasn't very long ago that it was strange to have a phone at all, first of all, a phone that, uh, that you could walk around with, then a phone that had uh, even a color screen, I remember back, you know, talking about whether color screens were important. And then I remember I had a time when I was out with some friends and we were fly fishing in Aspen and one of the guys took a, a, caught a fish and I had one of the first camera phones and I took a picture and sent it back to the people in his office and they couldn't believe how could you possibly do something like that. And yet today it's just commonplace and so in some sense all of us have, have become what I would say is, is born mobile. And, and what I really want to talk about today though is, is what that's going to mean uh, to many other things that we do in, in our lives. But maybe to start off with, because we're here to talk about innovation, um, you know, this is an area that is ripe for innovation. Uh, it's certainly created a lot of, of innovation. You can see, you know, the, the stat up here, 21 percent of the patents uh, are associated with mobile technology. Um, if you look at the overall sales uh, the revenues of the mobile industry globally, it's a, a trillion and a half dollars. Uh, it's, it's something like 2% of the gross domestic product of, of the world, which is kind of an amazing uh, uh, stat. So, um, you know, there really is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And then you think about, you know, it started out as sort of more hardware and you had to be RF engineers and have very specialized knowledge, but we all know today how applications are something that 
sort of many people are able to get involved with. And whether you know it's a story of a 15-year-old kid selling his company to Yahoo or you know some something like Apple, which became you know the most valuable company in the world on the basis of the you know user interface and usability of, of the device. There's a tremendous range of opportunities to invent both hardware software, services, and, and other kinds of things. And what's going on now is there's sort of three trends that I'm going to touch on here that I think are, are exciting and provide an opportunity for uh, increased innovation. Uh, and those three trends are one, some I think you probably heard about, you know, this notion that mobile is redefining all of computing, uh, which I don't think is any surprise to any of us who probably fewer people are uh, doing their email on their screen, their, their PC, and they're mostly doing it on a mobile device uh, these days. But, uh, you know, even looking at tablets taking over from PCs and the recent financial reports where, you know, the PC sales are slowing and uh, the mobile sales continue to, to grow. Uh, so, so that, I'm going to talk a little bit about that story. The next one is what we call a 1,000x data challenge. Now, I'll get into that in a little more detail, but it's basically around the idea that with all of these devices out there, there's tremendous, tremendous demand for throughput in the systems. Uh, we probably all have experienced times when a video didn't download as fast as we wanted or a, or a web page didn't download as fast as we wanted, and this is the way that we're going to solve that problem as more and more people get online. I'm going to talk to you about that. And then the final one that I'm going to spend a little bit more time on is we call the digital sixth sense, and it's really related to the fact that this uh, investment that we've made, uh, much as you just heard Rob Brooks talk about, sensors and computation coming from and cameras coming from uh, the cell phone industry uh, going into robots. This really is the same idea, but going into almost everything around us. And then the idea that we will use the phone as an interface, an ability to know what it is around us that we can perceive and that we can control. So we'll go through those each and just kind of talk to them. So when, when we think about mobility redefining computing, you know, what, do, what do I mean by that? Well, essentially we've come to the point where we expect out of our computing environment the same thing that we got out of our cell phone, our smartphone. So always on, instant on, always connected, thin, light, good battery life, all the, you know, portability, all these kinds of attributes that we have expected out of a phone now, or come to expect out of a phone, now we come to expect out of our larger computing environment. So our PC, our laptop, our tablet, these kinds of things uh, are, I think, increasingly commonplace. And so that's this trend that we're right in the middle of. This is not something that I'm telling you, oh, this is out in the future. This is clearly now, and we're in the middle of, of this trend. And in fact, if you look at what's happened with shipments of, of smartphones, they've, they've already uh, doubled uh, in terms of the number of smartphones shipped versus the number of PCs shipped. So, so doubled in, in 2012. Um, and, that, and now if you look at the install base, obviously PCs have been shipping for much longer, so there's an installed base, but by 2014, the installed base of smartphones should surpass the installed base of PCs. So from very long ago, we believed that the wireless internet was going to surpass the wired internet, and it's certainly true in emerging markets where we see most of the growth um, in, in mobile, or mo more of the growth uh, starting in the, in the emerging markets now. Um, a, an interesting stat that I have is that there's a million new smartphone users a day. That's three times the number of babies born. So really interesting how quickly, as I go back to that thought I started with about being born mobile, the fact that it's just being adopted and it's being adopted around the world very rapidly. And uh, you look in many emerging markets, the kind of price points that the phones are able to reach, getting under $100 and really shooting for, say, $50 kind of smartphones, um, that will open up the ability to use this technology to much, much larger numbers of, of people. And the way that we've gone about doing this is that we've obviously used 
integrated circuit technology to integrate more and more functionality into the devices. So, uh, you know, we started off really thinking about mobile phones in terms of how the radio works, but increasingly it's much more about other things. It's about the microprocessor technology. It's about the graphics, not just because you want to put a fancy game on there, but the whole user interface now is runs on three-dimensional and two-dimensional accelerated graphics, and that's become a very important component. The sensors have become very important. We support, have supported for quite some time GPS in the phone, but now there's a Russian system called GLONASS. That's in there as well, adding to the capability. Then it uses Wi-Fi also as a sensor sometimes. Obviously cameras and accelerometers. And in the future, we'll have things that are measuring more about the state of our health or more about the environment around us and use those things to actually create um, interesting opportunities to get information or to interact with the world. And I'll, I'll talk about that as we go into this digital sixth sense. But the really critical thing also when it comes to mobile devices is to make sure that you have great battery life. And so all of these things have come up in a classic, classic disruptive innovation manner from below, very focused on low power, portability, and so forth. And then the capabilities have increased, 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 increased until we get to the point where uh, you know, we can take technology that came from a cell phone and challenge the technology that came from the traditional computing industry. And so, so that's, that's a story that we're in the middle of right now. It's playing out you know, as we stand here. Uh, and I think over the next few years, you'll see just tremendous, tremendous amounts of innovation in terms of what your computing technology will do, how you'll interact with it, uh, and how it will you know, take different forms from what you've uh, traditionally done. Okay, now with, with those uh, kinds of devices, both the smartphones, tablets, and other kinds of devices that are going to, to be online, uh, we're seeing a huge, huge increase in data traffic. And we, we're working on trying to get, say, 10 to 12 times increase in the throughput of these mobile systems, how much data you could pump through the system. And people from NTT Docomo came to us one time and they, they said, well, 10 to 12 is nice, but we want 1,000. And the engineers kind of looked at each other, 1,000, huh? You know, we kind of scratched our head. But 1,000 times is basically a doubling every year for 10 years. And we've been doing that kind of doubling. And, uh, and to the extent that I have talked to uh, wireless operators and they say, I'm not seeing that kind of data demand. Usually the reason for that is that the marketing department has created a pricing plan by which the consumer buys as much as they can afford. They want more data, but they can't quite afford that much, so they're unhappy that they're paying more than they want to pay and getting less than they want. And so we need to fix that as a wireless industry. We need to give people you know, basically as much data as they possibly can consume and do that at a price point that's very reasonable. And the other thing is, it, as you look at these new devices coming out, the data demands are, are increasing. I mean, it, much of it is people watching video. I, I don't know how many people are watching the NBA playoffs on, ES, on Watch ESPN app, but that's clearly a very high data rate video app. And many people look at YouTube, and the kids are uploading and downloading all sorts of rich multimedia. And, and so in, uh, there was a measurement in 2011. Smartphones do 50 times the amount of data as a feature phone. And so as you think, more and more people getting online using smartphones, then the data demands just continue to go up and up. And then people create new applications and, and so on and so forth. OK, so 1,000 times. Now, we're not saying that if we give 1,000 times more data, then the operator should expect 1,000 times more revenue, because each bit is worth less, right? A video bit. There's so many of them to create that video image. It's got to be less valued than, say, the bit that went into an SMS, a text message. And clearly, they charge differently for that. So you're not going to get 1,000 times more revenue with 1,000 times more throughput. And so in fact, what you need to do is engineer the system completely differently to drive the cost down and drive it down about 1,000 times. The other thing we run into is a fundamental limit. Shannon 
Claude Shannon came up with you know, an information theory. My father is sitting down here as the early uh, uh, person uh, working in that uh, area, wrote a, a famous textbook on it. But essentially, the tricks that we've been able to do on the, in the chip, on the phone, in the signal processing, we've gotten essentially to those limits. And so it's not like we can really optimize any given radio link anymore and get that thousand times that we've sort of hit a fundamental limit there. So something different has to be done. And what we did was we changed not the technology per se, but really what I say the topology of the network. And so the network today, if you look at a cellular network, it's what I'll call outside in. They have big towers outside the building transmitting and they then try and penetrate the signal into the building where you then use your cell phone. And you get certain capability from that, but these systems are now limited by what, how much you can receive and how much the cell site can receive from you. And so the best way to get higher data rates is actually to move the devices and the network closer together, to make them more dense. And so we call that actually the inside out network, where you deploy a cellular network much in the same way that you deploy a Wi-Fi network. So people just get a thing and they put it up in their office or in their home and then that will give you very high speed data. And it turns out that um, when you do this inside out network, in addition, we're not getting rid of the outside in network, but when you do this inside out network, most of the data traffic uh, with very small amounts of penetration of these things, you know, few of them in you know, a scattering of houses in a neighborhood, that actually will take most of the traffic of the network, which you would guess, since I'm telling you that I'm going to get a thousand times more capacity out of that. So we're going to have lots and lots of cells all around, maybe you know, one per room or one per phone or things like that. And you may have noticed if you've used some of the new technologies, say you bought a 4G phone and you realized in the beginning you were getting this incredible data rate because you were the only one using that in that cell. But as soon as all these other people came along, the data rate started slowing down and slowing down. And that's because you're sharing the cell with other people. But if we do this inside out network, you may have the whole cell to yourself and therefore you get very, very high data rates as well. So how do we actually make that happen? Well, we basically build a cell site that's much more like a, a cell phone. So that's a quarter and that's a cell site. So it's normally you think of a cell site as that thing on the side of the road, the big tower and the box next to it, and that's what it's going to be in the future. And it will just plug into the wall and that will give you, you your cellular service. And if you look at a cellular phone, or sorry, a base station right now, the equipment that goes into it is in the tens of thousands of dollars, ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars, say. Uh, but building the site and equipping it and getting everything uh, set up for it and maintaining it and connecting it, that may make a cell site a hundred thousand dollars. So this is like a hundred dollars to a hundred thousand, and there's a thousand x. Uh, change in cost. And so that's, that's the way we're going to solve that problem. Okay, so the next thing that I, that I want to talk about, which I think is more, maybe more towards the future and more um, kind of where we're headed, is this notion of the digital sixth sense. And the, the idea here is that the phone has an ability to perceive cyberspace things, virtual things that are associated with the world around us, uh, in a way that our natural senses don't. And so the phone or the connected device that we're carrying uh, will give us that interface, that ability to sense and control and get content and get information from the world around us in a way that we haven't previously been able to do. And this kind of goes a little bit towards the way that I, I've been running the company, which is really about um, driving it through vision. We don't per se have strategy. We do strat planning, but really that those are tactical plans that are informed by the vision of the company. And, and I would say, and that this is a little bit, um, you know, looking backwards uh, towards the very beginning of the company, because when Irwin started Qualcomm, uh, they didn't really have any products in mind. It was a group of people who knew digital communications theory. So I would say the vision of the company in the beginning was digital communications technology is an incredible technology and 
looking back, it, it was founded at a time when in a previous company they were able to use digital communication technology for military and space applications because of the cost of doing the computation, but Moore's Law drove that cost down so that in Qualcomm they were able to use it for commercial and consumer applications. And that's really, that transition to me marks the difference between these two companies. Now it's not quite as black and white as that, but, it, but that's roughly correct. Then the next vision of the company was around CDMA, the technology that we use for 3G uh, cell phones. And this really came out of a satellite system that they were proposing and on a drive back from Los Angeles, Erwin and, and another engineer, Klein Gilhausen, realized that you could control the uh, uh, signal to a cell site and you could get this great increase in capacity. And it was at a time when analog cell phones were around and the wireless operators were worried about hitting what they called the brick wall of capacity. They didn't think they were going to be able to satisfy all the demand for just making voice calls. And here we came along with this wireless technology that gave them much, much greater capacity. And then we spent many, many years fighting because we were coming in with a radically different disruptive technology to what people had been used to. We had people claiming that it violated the laws of physics and all sorts of things, but that was the vision. The vision for the company was just drive CDMA, single-minded, let's go, go do that. But what happened while we were doing that was we also recognized that uh, it was a packet data system and we could run the internet on top of it. And while in the early 90s when we did this, the internet wasn't so popular, and in fact, the uh, wireless operators asked us to make it sound like a dial-up modem and work like a dial-up modem back then, we actually built the internet protocols on the inside of this system and so that a year later, after we had launched with this dial-up modem service, we actually just slapped a web browser onto the phone and put and connected on the other side directly into the internet. And so we believed, as I said earlier, for, from a very early stage that the wireless internet was going to be a, have a more profound impact on the world than the wired internet. And so we spent a lot of time doing things like building software downloading systems. So in 2000, we actually launched the first app store and you could download applications and if you buy a, a Verizon feature phone today you're still using that same system that we, we designed back in, uh, in early 2000. And there were a lot of other implications to having wireless data connectivity and, and one of the things that was great about that was we didn't have to spend a lot of time in the company thinking through strategy. What everybody in the company knew with this vision was that if they came up with an idea that caused people to want to use more wireless data, that was going to be good for us because we did it better than anybody else did. And so we came then along the idea of building smartphones, uh, we built the first uh, Palm-based uh, smartphone uh, launched in 97-98, um, and, uh, and, and the idea of putting GPS into the phone and really came to this idea that the phone was going to be the center of people's lives, that we would integrate not just communications, but computing and productivity and entertainment, all these kinds of capabilities into the phone. And so we started off in that direction. And, and that's the path that we've been on for, you know, I would argue, I don't know, maybe 15 years now we've been, we've been working on that, those kinds of ideas, maybe even a little more, because we, we built the first smartphone a little bit earlier than that. So anyway, so, um, so these ideas uh, really are the ones that everybody kind of knows about now. So if you have a vision, it's great to be continuing on the vision. And all of these visions that we had in the past are visions that we continue to execute on the company. But this one about the digital sixth sense, I think, is the one of the future. Because it, it interrelates between a lot of things that are coming together, trends that you see early, but they haven't really necessarily arrived in the, in the full force that they're going to. And so what's, what does this mean, then, to augment our, our traditional senses with, uh, with a digital sixth sense. It means that we are going to have to communicate with all of these devices, an internet of everything of devices that are around us. Those devices are going to have to communicate with each other. We're going to have to sense them. We're going to have to secure them. We're going to have to allow them to interact with, the, with us and with each other and with things uh, such as the cloud out, outside. And so, so really, if you look at 
the way that uh, we look at this is that the, one of the fundamental components of this is this internet of everything, or some people say internet of things. But if you look at the kinds of numbers of how many com connected devices uh, that are going to be out there, so this is a, a stat for 2020, uh, 24 billion connected devices. Now all those devices need to be able to inter interact with each other. And today, I would argue that many things are in silos. And we want to break those silos down and allow the, the cell phone, the smartphone, to sit in the middle of this and allow us as human beings to, to interact with it. And these connected devices also, not only do they sit in silos of software and services, but they also sit in silos of hardware and radios. They run on different kinds of radios. There's sort of a tower of Babel of all kinds of different things that, that they may speak to each other. And those things are now increasingly getting integrated into the chip that goes inside your cell phone. So the cell phone again can sit in the center of this and provide a, a lot of capability to integrate. And so these, these various connected things, whether it's you know cars or, uh, or thermostats or uh, I can't really see the slide, washing machines, you know, I actually, I always thought it was funny, you know, to talk about, from Qualcomm, to talk about a connected washing machine, like to have washing machines on my slides, but actually it does make sense. We, we have a system now where there's a, a washing machine manufacturer that's going to build something that over a technology we have will send a notification to the screen of your television or to your phone when your wash is done so that you can go fold the clothes or move stuff from the washer to the dryer or whatever it is you, you need to do so your clothes don't get wrinkled and, and so forth. So there, and, and of course you want to have the, the electric meter maybe be able to talk to it just in case you need to worry about you want to do your drying at a time when the electricity is cheaper or some, some other uh, reason like that. Uh, so, so things are going to be absolutely connected and a lot of work going on in various different vertical industries and you see this really in the, in the car industry, you really see it today. I mean, GM came out in January and announced that all of their cars are going to be connected with 4G technology and they were following BMW and Audi who had already uh, announced that as well and it's just kind of going along. All these, all these companies are, are connecting their, their cars up but it really is a much broader thing than that. And then in, then in terms of, of places, well, places have been connected in a certain way. You, you often use your phone to go search for a nearby restaurant and get the reviews about that, get, get the information, where, how do I get there, what's, um, what's on the menu, the, these kinds of things. Or you go to a museum, you want to get some information uh, before you go. So places have been connected, but they've not been connected necessarily in a proximal way, meaning that they weren't necessarily connected because you were there in the space and the space was actually providing that information to you. And you can think of this uh, for things like meetings. I mean, even here, you might come in in the future and you'll have, the, the room will offer to you to download my slides so that you can take them, take them with you. Or you might imagine going into a retail store and you, are, you have a loyalty card with them. Uh, say it's a Starbucks and you walk in and they can offer you something. You can check in automatically and they can know whether you're there. Or we have technologies that actually preserve your anonymity so they don't necessarily know that Paul Jacobs walked in but they know that somebody walked in who might be amenable to a certain kind of offer. And we all, we all talk about the, the, uh, the movie, the, the Minority Report, where you walked by and you controlled things and you walked by screens and the screens reacted to. That technology exists and you'll, you'll have that and it will be done in a way that will manage and preserve your anonymity and, and your security. And then of course people, connecting people to each other. So you might imagine walking into the room and, and I have this issue, you know, you meet so many people and here it's nice we all have badges on but wouldn't it be nice if the phone could just tell you, okay, these are the set of people that are in the room, maybe whisper it in your ear, show it on the screen, show it on a smart watch that you might be wearing. These kinds of things will happen and people have stuff that they want to share with you. So whether it's pictures they've taken or information about themselves, uh, we at a recent developer conference, we had a system where everybody carried around an app on their phone and it actually matched people up and they said, oh, you're actually near this person that's also interested in this thing that you're interested in so you guys can get together and have a chat about it. And it really just changes the way people interact, not just virtual social networks, but actually in real life, in proximity to each other. So 
I think that, you know, that, that will be a, an amazing change for us and certainly for people like me who have a hard time keeping track of all the people that, that you meet, it would be great to, to have that. So, so that's a technology that, that we're very interested in. So, so the way that this all works now is by allowing these different devices to discover each other in a very common fashion. So we have an a, a open source technology called AllJoin, which we've put out. So we don't, as Qualcomm, we're not trying to control all of these devices talking to each other, but the industry really is lacking just a common way of them to message to each other and to talk to each other. And so we put that out as an open source technology, and it is being adopted by car manufacturers and white goods manufacturers and cell phone manufacturers. So all of these different, and you know, display manufacturers, consumer electronics, all these different things will have a common way to talk, but it's open source, so it's not controlled by any one company. And for us, the reason that that's important is we just need the tide to rise for this idea of digital sixth sense and internet of everything to take off. And as I said, one other thing that's really critical, and, and it was a point that Rod Brooks made, was that things need to be easy to use. And today, you probably know that when you go in and you have to set up your Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth connection, it's really quite a painful experience, making sure you have all the different codes and right IDs and all those kinds of things. This is really intended that things will just plug in place. So they have a way of discovering different devices using this messaging bus will have a way of communicating to each other. And they'll actually have a way of communicating to each other their capabilities. So a car, when I get into my car with this technology in it and with my, on my phone as well, the car will know, okay, Paul Jacobs just got into my car. These are his preferences. Here is the content that he has that might be of interest. The car will tell my phone, here's the screen, here's the buttons, the mics, the speakers, all of the different technologies that you can control in the car and things of the car, the, the windows, the, the, so forth. But then think about also my friends get in my car as well. And now the car will actually know all of us who are actually in the car. And then say, I want to play something. My friend has a piece of music they want to play. We can all do a jukebox together and the car can mediate between those things. And I will give the rights to my friends to use the speaker in my car only while they're in my car. The second they get out of the car, they lose that right. They're not able then to send things. And this, will all, this kind of stuff will all happen uh, completely transparently to the user and very automatically. And so this is the kind of technology allowing them to talk and control each other to provide, to discover what the capabilities, what services are available in the environment around them. So that, that's a technology that we're doing. Another technology is sort of the other piece of it, is what happens when you know this kind of information, how do you work with it? And we have a technology called Gimbal that, uh, it's, I don't know if any of you are Star Trek fans, usually innovators are, um, but the new Star Trek movie they're, they have an app, and that app actually lets you go places and do missions. And that technology uses different uh, underlying technologies. So there are things that recognize geofences. I am in a particular location. I went to the local theater, and therefore I completed some mission. It has audio recognition. I am watching a video, and there's some sound that's coming out that it recognized, so I listen to a certain thing. Uh, image recognition, I can go up to a poster and I use that to recognize, oh, I'm looking at this poster and I can download things. And so you complete your missions through these different things. Now that's an early stage of this notion of proximal uh, you know, interaction, interacting with things that are nearby me. But there are new technologies, new radio technologies that we're developing that will make it even more seamless, and as I said, more uh, software technology, and those things will be announced as, as time goes on here. But it really is intended to provide a, a platform for innovation. We're not, we're, we're an enabling technology company. We're really trying to open this up to people to build their uh, technology on top of it. And, and in fact, in the case of Gimbal, not only did the Star Trek app come out, but there's been uh, in Japan some, uh, some of the large uh, ad agencies are using it and they've shown that by doing things that are related to where you are, you increase the interaction rates by 30%. So the purchasing rates or the click-through rates or various kinds of things. So really tremendous improvement in, uh, in engagement by having some knowledge of what's, what's around you. So that's an exciting technology. The, the, the last technology 
that's kind of an enabling technology is, uh, is uh, what we call augmented reality. And it's the idea that you can put virtual objects into the scene as the camera of your phone sees it and as the display of your phone shows it to you. So we can actually put something and lock it into place so that you will see an image, the real image of the world with virtual objects actually composited into that. And the, the image that I'm showing here is one in which user interfaces can be exported from some device that's in the world around us that I'm not necessarily going up to. So you can see controls for different devices, whether it's for the consumer electronics devices, a little thing pops out the side of it that allows me to control it. Uh, there's thermostats on here, there's things about the weather, there's all sorts of information about the world around me that can get composited into this image of the world. And, and unlike many other systems, this will get locked to it. So it actually looks, I, I can have a thing where I drag and drop, in fact we've done these demos, drag and drop content from my phone onto a screen using, that I'm looking at with the camera and what that then tells the phone to do is actually make a connection to that screen and start playing that content on the screen. So I'll see it first on my phone that I dragged it and that will be done with, with computer vision and with compositing that image into the, into the image on the camera, I mean on the screen, and then it will actually happen in real life that that screen will light up with that content. And so the ability to export the user interface, to export to the device what it is that it's trying to look at so it knows I now recognize that's a TV or I now recognize this is where the thermostat is in the room or this is the speaker that I'm trying to control or this is the projector or any, any kind of thing that might be in the world around us. So this notion of augmented reality is the thing that really gives you a very simple user interface to all of, this, all of the services and content that may be uh, offered to you around you. And, and just to give you one last simple idea of this, one of the things that we're doing is automatic translation. So you'll take your phone and you'll look at a sign in a foreign country or a menu and it looks at the, recognizes the words, translates them and then remaps them back where they were and not only that, but it makes them clickable. So now you can press on it, and so the real world will have the same characteristic that a web page does, that things will actually be clickable, and you can go in and get more information. You can, you can translate, you can do all the things that you do on the web, but it will be done to the real world. Okay, so, where, wh so what does this mean to our lives? Well, one of, the, one of the areas that we're very focused on is improving healthcare. Healthcare is an area that it's too expensive, it's bankrupting developed countries, and it's not accessible enough in developing countries. And so we're very focused on using mobile technology to, to connect medical devices, to connect you to your healthcare professional. And I, I make the analogy to the way that we feel about our phones today, which is when you have your cell phone, you feel connected to your friends and your family and your colleagues, not because you're talking to them all the time, but because you can, because you know you have a phone and they have a phone and no matter where they are, when it is, you can reach out and touch them. I believe that in the next five to 10 years, you will feel the same way about your healthcare professional. You'll feel like somebody is watching over you, not because they're doing it all the time, it's not intrusive like that, but if you have an issue, it can be detected and something can happen. And we're working with a, a researcher right now that's building a sensor that's made to be injected into your bloodstream. And what this sensor will do will detect certain things floating in your blood that two weeks before you have a heart attack will tell you, you're gonna have a heart attack in two weeks, go to the doctor. So imagine your cell phone ringing and you get that and it tells you go to the doctor. I mean, it's that kind of technology that's possible. And before you say, oh, people won't want to have technology inside them, people already today, there have been studies on people with pacemakers where a connected pacemaker is, has a 50% reduction in mortality rate to a non-connected one because if something happens, you're not delaying, putting it off, saying, oh, there's some you know, other reason why this is not feeling right. The doctor knows right away that there's uh, you know, instantaneous um, communication. And, and so these kinds of things will also be very, very important for managing chronic diseases as well. Uh, you know, a lot of chronic diseases are relatively simple to treat as long as the person manages the treatment regimen, that they continuously, uh, uh, you know, abide by it. And giving the feedback loop that having the connectivity will provide 
helps people stay on their treatment regimes. And, and that, I, we think, can have a, a huge impact. Um, I, should be, I shouldn't have switched. Uh, one, one last thing that I, that I want to say. We, we're, we've done an X Prize. So I don't know how many people have heard of the X Prize. We have a $10 million X Prize right now to build a tricorder. So back to the Star Trek theme again. Um, so a device, a handheld device, which will be, uh, the, the goal is to uh, diagnose 15 diseases better than a panel of doctors. And so in, I think it's roughly three years from now, that competition will be held. There's almost 300 teams now that are pre-registered for the competition around the world. And I, I believe this technology is there because the sensors are being designed by people. Different decision support software is being designed by people. And, and of course, we're doing a lot on the cell phone side to integrate all of these technologies together. Uh, but somebody needs to do the full system integration. I, I believe this will happen and it will help people in developed countries so that you don't necessarily have to go to the doctor or go to the emergency room to figure out, you know, does your kid have some, some issue. And in, and in developing countries, it will provide healthcare capabilities to places that haven't had them. Okay, another area that I wanted to talk about was education. And education, you say, okay, well, teachers don't necessarily want to have uh, phones in schools. They're worried that the kid's going to cheat or do something that they're not supposed to do in the school, be distracted. Uh, well, what we've found, we've done a number of projects where giving the children the ability to actually communicate with each other, to teach each other how they learned how to solve an algebra problem, actually improves their test scores dramatically. And so these, these kinds of programs that we put together have been funded, um, in one case funded by the Army because we did it at a school that was near an Army base and they saw how well it worked that they wanted to actually extend it to, to other schools near other Army bases. Another thing that we've done is we've used that, that virtual, um, that augmented reality technology. So imagine today you use a textbook. The textbook, say a physics textbook, and it has a diagram of an experiment in it. Well, kids today, they're used to using the web. They're used to having rich multimedia. So you point a tablet at that uh, textbook and now the experiment comes to life and they can actually interact with it. And so the notion that we can actually take traditional media and make it augmented and make it rich and give the children a chance to interact with it, I think is another thing that's uh, going to be tremendously valuable. And so a lot of projects underway using connected technology, uh, the ability for the teacher to keep track of which kids are doing better or worse, and the kids can actually talk to each other. The parents can talk to the teacher without it being, oh, I have to schedule an appointment to go in and see my teacher, you know, my kid's teacher, and that really raises sort of the level of concern. This can happen at a very simple sending a text message back and forth and, and so forth. So the notion that we'll be able to, to um, really do a, a significant amount to improve education, I think, is, is something that's on the way. So I think, you know, basically the way I would close is, is if you are looking for an opportunity to innovate, the mobile field is, is clearly an opportunity. And it's an opportunity that you shouldn't think of as just restricted to mobile itself, to building a device, a new smartphone, or those kinds of things. Because those are obviously being done by large companies. The opportunity to do things like use 3D printing technology and to use some of the um, reference designs that are out there. Yeah, you can make devices, but it's also about building services and applications and applying it to things that we need as, as society. And, and I just close by saying uh, this is not any hype because there are 6.6 .6 billion mobile connections in the world. There's 2 billion mobile broadband connections in the world. It is humanity's biggest technology platform. So thanks very much.